Hello, my friends. Welcome to the 47th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I'm coming to you today from Sydney, Australia. We're doing another interview breakdown today of a fantastic conversation I had back in Auckland with Dr. Patrick Girard, who works with paraconsistent logic. That is a logic which is a bit more tolerant of contradiction. If you guys have been following the show, you know that my own logic is about as intolerant as contradiction as conceivably possible, but we still had a great conversation and I'm gonna break it down for you. Before we start, I've got a YouTube clip recommendation for you. The CEO and founder of Praxis, which is the company sponsoring this podcast, was just invited to go on Tucker Carlson to talk about his company, because as I've said before many times on the show, Praxis is exploding in popularity and for good reason. So go to YouTube and punch in Tucker Carlson Praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, and listen to their awesome interview. If you're unfamiliar with the company, let me tell you about it. They are on the leading edge of offering alternatives to the failing university system. They take young people that either haven't gone into college or are in college and unsatisfied with their college experience. They give them three months of actual real-world job training and then immediately put them into a paid apprenticeship for six months. After you complete their program, they contractually guarantee you a job offer. And right now, Praxis is totally changing the game for young people who want to enter into the workplace. And the net cost of the program to participants is zero dollars. So it's not just me raving about this program. It's been so successful that now it's even getting picked up on mainstream outlets. If that sounds like something you're interested in, go to steve-patterson.com slash Praxis. You can learn more about it and get a free module from their Praxis curriculum sent straight to your inbox. All right, so with this conversation with Patrick Girard, we talked for maybe about 20 minutes or so about truth. It was really interesting. I could probably dedicate a whole breakdown just to that conversation. But I want to do this breakdown starting about the 25-minute mark where we start talking about logic, paraconsistent logic, contradictions, and classical logic. So I begin by asking him a question from the classical logical perspective, which is my own perspective, which when I think of contradictions, I immediately associate, you know, a logical contradiction with an error in thought, that I have exactly 0% tolerance for any kind of logical contradiction. He disagrees, and in the course of this conversation, he gives a great explanation for people that are maybe unfamiliar with this position, why he thinks maybe contradictions aren't as big a deal as somebody like me would make them out to be. So the, in this way of thinking, there's a, a very visceral reaction to contradictions, to contradictory mm. claims. Yes. So could you give some explanation? I know in some of your work you have, maybe a, you're more tolerant of contradictions. Mm. Could you explain why contradictions aren't as big a deal, maybe as the classical logicians make them out to be? Yeah, so contradictions are obviously a big deal, and it's obviously important to care about them and they've always so, so that is true it has occupied philosophers and logicians since for a long time because um, I guess for a lot of people once you're committed to a contradiction um, basically you're committed to the moon is made of blue cheese like if, if there's no if it, it, it's sort of a measure of incoherence that once you have a belief that something is both true and false at the same time, mm -hmm. that basically uh, all bets are off. If you can commit yourself to something as bad as a contradiction, mm. then basically you've just trivialized. Okay, so that's a great place to start and it's an excellent summation of the classical view and my view. That, that if anywhere in your worldview you're saying, well, here is something that's true and false, you've essentially just exploded the foundations for your entire world, where, we, where you've essentially, and from my perspective, said true and false is now meaningless. Because as it comes up later, we can only have a coherent and sensible understanding of what truth is if we distinguish it from not truth. And if you blur those lines, you've kind of blurred the only tool we have for discerning true from not true. He continues. So, so inconsistency and contradiction has become the measure of um, triviality mm -hmm. of incoherence because no logician wants triviality no mm -hmm. one wants everything to be true if right. everything is true then you know what are we doing <laughs> and nothing is true everything is true nothing is true you know it, right. it's all trivial like I'm losing my time I might as well just go play video games and right. I'll be fine with that mm -hmm. like I don't need to so no logician want that 
Okay, so that's a bit of technical jargon that's actually really good to keep in your mind. There is a logical theory called trivialism, and trivialism can be summarized as such. All propositions are true. That includes all contradictory propositions, so A and not A at the same time in the same way. Every single proposition is true. And as you can imagine, that's, for most people, not a very desirous theory because it essentially throws out this whole idea of truth and falsehood, and it's aptly named, I think, trivialism. But that's what he's saying is, you know, no logician wants to trivialize, wants to say, oh, okay, now because there's a contradiction, that means everything is true. The question is how do we know that, or how do we prevent ourselves from getting into a trivial system? Mm -hmm. And exactly. a common reaction is that once is, is, is what is called the, um, the law of explosion, that everything follows from a contradiction. Mm -hmm. It's this idea that once you committed yourself to contradiction, then all bets are off. Right. We don't know anymore. So I guess that's the intuition that has been driven a lot of research in the 20th century and overall in history as well in mathematics, just making sure that we don't uh, end up in contradiction. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it is, so that, I guess that rule of explosion has become the measure of triviality. Okay, one more bit of jargon that's very good to understand if you want to grasp this, um, it's kind of the history of logical reasoning. It's this, the principle or the law of explosion, which says that everything follows from a contradiction or from a falsehood. So if I say, if squares are circular, then I am 35 feet tall. Or if squares are circular, then the moon is made of cheese. If squares are circular, if something is false is true, then anything goes. And that's the traditional way of putting it, and I agree with this. The way that I would put it is, if it's the case that in there is any case of something that is true that is actually not true, <laughs> then true doesn't make any sense. Neither does not true. We can't know anything about anything, and any attempt at internal coherence of a thought is impossible. Because without logical consistency, we're only one step away, I would say, from madness. If you want to know more in detail of my own case for why there are certainly, I would say, no logical contradictions, that is exactly the subject of my first book on philosophy, Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge, which you can pick up on Amazon. But there is sort of the dream. Think of it as a dream that you're going to, that we're going to, truth is that kind of thing that's going to carve the universe between, you know, there's the true things and the false things. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to like throw a lasso in the universe and I'm going to pull it and what I'm going to pull back is only all and only the true things. Okay. Right? So that's, you can think of it as Starsky's dream if you want. That would be a truth predicate. So okay. something will be in my, in my, col in, in the collection I've just had or in my bag only if it's true and all the true things will be in there. Okay, now this. Now, it may seem esoteric, and it may not seem very important, but what he just said and what he's about to say is absolutely central if you want to understand the history of modern mathematical and modern logical thinking. I have been on the pursuit of what I call irrationalism, this idea that there are logical contradictions, you can't actually know anything about anything, the world is gray and blurry, I have pursued what the fundamental beliefs are which lead people to these conclusions. And my pursuits have wound up in a few areas. One area, people appeal to quantum physics. Another one they appeal to is religious mysticism. Another one that they appeal to, interestingly enough, is various arguments in mathematics. But this is one example, kind of historically, of the origins of what I consider to be irrationalism coming from the liar's paradox, and specifically for the reason that many philosophers have claimed the liar's paradox, which is this sentence is false, is a true contradiction. It is true and false, and therefore, this naive idea that we could have in a, you know, a particular theory or a particular way of talking about the universe that is devoid of contradictions is a little naive. You could put it another way. You could say that According to this way of thinking, and historically this is the case, various philosophers and mathematicians and logicians have tried to claim that inconsistency is inescapable. That if you want to have a powerful enough language to say almost anything meaningful about the world, 
you're necessarily going to include some logical contradictions. It's something that's just the nature of language. Some people say it's the nature of truth. The nature of reality is that these contradictions are inescapable. So a great deal of what we're talking about in this interview really comes back to the liar's paradox, or as he puts it, the Tarski sentence. And what okay. Tarski showed us is that you can't do that because your bag will also have false things in there. Okay. Right? Because as soon as you try, the lasso itself is an, it will, will also return false things. That's the liar sentence. Because mm -hmm. if you have a predicate that says um, a, a truth predicate, so a truth predicate would be a predicate that applies to propositions and, you know, it applies to the proposition when the proposition is true. Mm -hmm. It's very simple and it just says this proposition is true as we're talking about it. But it's isolating, isolating this is true things as a predicate. Mm -hmm. that could be used in propositions. Okay. Once you can do that, you can create the liar sentence. The liar sentence is a sentence that says of itself that it is false, mm -hmm. right? So is the liar sentence true? Well, if it's true, then what it says is true. What it says is that it's false, and so it's false, right? So it's false. Well, if it's false, then what it says is, is, is false, and what it says is of itself uh, that is false, so it's true. Right. Right. So you end up in that contradiction. Right. Right. So if you, so holding that dream that you can return all and only the true propositions mm -hmm. leads you to an inconsistency. Okay. So again, the way that I would put it is, the claim is that contradictions seem to be unavoidable, and therefore, the let's say mature response isn't to try to eliminate contradictions because they're unavoidable. The mature response is to say, let's deal with them. Let's grapple and accept that, that contradictions are kind of inescapable, the truth and falsehood. At the same time, that's just the way it is. Maybe it's not as big a deal as the classical logicians make it out to be. Now, one way that philosophers have tried to say well, maybe contradictions aren't as big a deal, is by attacking or challenging this idea of the principle of explosion. They say, okay, well, yes, in some circumstances, you get true contradictions, but that doesn't trivialize the system. The law of explosion doesn't hold. Yes, they might agree that trivialization is a bad thing, but they would disagree that from a contradiction, anything follows. This, we talked just ever so briefly about this in the conversation I had with Dr. Timothy Williamson of Oxford, where we were talking about the philosopher Graham Priest is known for doing this. He is a dialetheist, which means he thinks that there are some true contradictions, but he also thinks they're kind of limited and not a very big deal. Okay, so before we move on, yeah. are there any other uh, sentences, like the liar sentence, which the lasso brings back, or is it just the liar sentence? The true sentence will uh, bring back that one. Th th it may have some companion ones and that are, con that are contradictory? Probably. Yeah, I don't know right off the top of my head. But, okay. Uh, but we can, maybe we can revisit that. Yeah. Um, All right, now here's why I ask him that question. Because I have a resolution for the liar's paradox, which you can read about in square one. I also have, a while ago I wrote a little article on the topic, I also have a YouTube video. My most popular YouTube video is One Resolution to the Liar's Paradox. It essentially says it's a linguistic error, that it's kind of a trick, that this sentence is false. If you actually break it down, this sentence doesn't really refer to anything. If it refers to itself, namely the words of this sentence, then it's not true and it's not for false. It's not a proposition. It's just two words, this sentence. But if this sentence refers to this sentence is false, then it generates an infinite regress because every time you ask, what is this sentence, you're left with this sentence is false. So then the liar's paradox turns into this sentence is false is false. And you say, okay, well, what exactly, which sentence is false? Oh, well, it's this sentence is false is false is false ad infinitum. It's easier to see with parentheses and maybe written down. So I asked him that question specifically because it's a, <laughs> if you're interested in logic and truth, and we're talking about some of the most important ideas in the world, like, oh, maybe contradictions are inescapable. <laughs> if that's true, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big deal. So if the only case of this 
inescapable contradiction is the liar's paradox. And I think there's a satisfactory resolution to the liar's paradox. Well, maybe we don't have to abandon classical logic at all. Maybe we don't have to incorporate any contradictions into our worldview. And in my research, I have not found any other types of argument for the inescapability of logical contradictions that don't un ultimately come down to self-reference. There's this other paradox, which is called the barber's paradox, which is that imagine a barber who shaves everybody that does not shave himself. Does the barber shave himself? Well, he must, which means well, he wouldn't, which means he must, which means he wouldn't, and so on. Oh, it's true and false at the same time. There's a few self-referential things like that, but I would say in every circumstance, this is a problem of language. It's not a problem of truth. It's, it's certainly not a problem of logic. We've got the lasso. We, the idea is we want to only get the true things and have All the system. All and only. All and only, exactly. Yes. But in that particular system, we get this anomaly, the liar sentence. This sentence is false. Well, it's true. But if it's true, it's false. If it's false, it's true. It's a contradiction. Now what? Well, now the 20th century, the 20th century tradition says contradiction, warning, triviality. Now I have a trivial theory, and therefore I back away. Right. Go away from contradictions. The lesson does not exist. Right? Okay. So that's, <laughs> that has been the reaction. Okay, so there's no truth predicate. <laughs> okay. Right. That seems like an extreme reaction. It, it's well <laughs> said in that way. So I, maybe I've geared the story so okay. as to get okay. as an extreme reaction. But that's sort of what has happened. Okay. That we said, okay, so that was a that was a great dream, but that dream can't happen because it leads to inconsistency. So you can think of twentieth century logicians as going on the shoot. So okay, we'll just make sure that we're not going to get all truth, but we're only going to get truth. Right? Okay. Fair so enough. we're going to we're going to restrict our analysis such that we're going to take a smaller lasso kind of thing. It's just going to, mm -hmm. what it brings back, we're, we're just going to make sure that they're true and only true kind of things. Okay. So they're under shooting, right? Okay. Well, to preserve consistency. To preserve consistency because okay. consistency would be, it, is important. Right. But to a certain extent, it kind of changes what we thought was truth, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so I love this lasso analogy. Right, the, the idea is that you've got this, out there you've got truth, and you have this lasso. And the ideal world, you'd be able to sling the lasso out, get all the true propositions in the world, all and only the true propositions. I mean, you wouldn't get any false propositions there. Bring the lasso back, and boom, now you have this perfect theory. Well, what he's saying is, well, what the liar's paradox is doing is it's saying you can't have this system which includes all truths. If, you're, if your lasso's that big, then it's also gonna include these contradictions. So if you want to get all the truths, then you have to accept a little bit of inconsistency in your system. Now what he says is, so the response of 20th century logicians is to undershoot, maybe shrink the size of the lasso. So we don't get any inconsistent conclusions or any consistent truths. We throw the lasso out and what we return is only truth but there's, we don't get all of it. There's truth out there that we're not going to be able to capture because our system isn't powerful enough or our lasso isn't big enough. It's a beautiful analogy. An alternative reaction is you say, okay, I'm going to do the opposite. I don't want to miss out any truth, but I'm going to accept that some of them will also be false. So you overshoot. Okay. Right? So that would be, a, so that's where you say, okay, the log, the, so you're going to say the log explo explosion is no longer valid. Okay. That uh, inconsistencies is no longer a measure of triviality, right? So you're gonna say, okay, I, I want to keep my lasso, but my lasso has this this funny feature that for some sentences it returns some that are both true and false. Okay. So I need to make sure that I don't trivialize because of that. And how do I how do I keep all truths, right? And not trivialize. And so that all is, truths and then some. And, and then some, some, some of them will okay. be false. And, and so okay. that's a way of thinking about dialectic logic. So yeah. that's a logic that accepts that there are contradictions. And so you have always a but kind of clause. Well, you know, all tautologies are true, some are also false. <laughs> you know, the, the truth predicates only return true formulas, some are also false. There's always a but clause kind of thing. Beautiful. I, you won't hear it more clearly articulated anywhere. I think that dialectic position, that the goal is to have this lasso that can pull back all the truths but some of the truths are false now 
This came up a little bit when I had a, a conversation with Dr. Stephen Hicks, who I will have back on the show, who said, well, the interesting thing about contradictions is how philosophers react to the contradictions. And we didn't get to dive into that, though. We certainly will. My reaction is to say, okay, well, if, you're, if some of the truths that you're pulling back are false, <laughs> you've made a catastrophic error that has, you know, you put dynamite under the fundamentals of the entire idea of pulling back truth, if you're saying, oh, and some truth is false. But he's saying, it's not that big a deal. Yeah, we want to get all the truth. And if that means some of the truth is false, that's just something we have to deal with. A crude way of putting this that I have heard some people say that, that Dr. Girard didn't say, but I've heard from, from irrationalists who say, well, I am large, I contain multitudes. That's, if you catch them in a contradiction, that's what they say. Well, I'm large, I contain multitudes. I contradict myself, but that's okay. Contradictions maybe aren't that big a deal. But doesn't, <laughs> doesn't that kind of deflate the notion of truth, though, when we say we're going to say some things are true or we're going to say, in this lasso, got all truths, but some of them are false and true, yes. right? Doesn't that kind of def doesn't that defeat the the idea of what we mean by true is that they're not false? Well, we got all the truth. We wanted all the truth. Yeah, but it, okay. So, but it's okay. It, it, what 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 is it, it? Doesn't make the game easy. It makes the game a lot harder. You're saying it makes the game a lot harder because we don't want to trivialize either, right? It's not like all of a sudden we're saying, "Oh, contradictions are fun." I right. can't. We can't right. be saying that all contradictions are true. Okay. Right. If all contradictions are true, then everything is true, right? But if, right. Um, if all contradictions are true, then everything is true. What I would say, you could say that, but I would kind of go one step below that. I would say then truth is meaningless because. What's, there seems to be this polarity between sure, sure, what sure. we mean okay, by sure. true and false. I, I, sure, okay. I, th I think I can go with, with you on that okay. one. Right. So I don't want my lawsuit to return everything because like, truth has just gone out. Right. Like it's, now it would be genuinely meaningless. Meaningless. So yeah. that would be unusable because we'd have some kind of trivial, you know, would be trivial. So forget about truth. Right. right. No. So, but I don't, yes, so we agree with that. And most people that are in these kind of projects to like overshoot. Mm -hmm. will then try to find me different kind of measures just to make sure that we don't trivialize. So we need some kind of new measures that will tell us which contradictions are acceptable and which aren't. Okay. But so we can't only rely on contradictions anymore because inconsistency is no longer the measure. So what I was trying to get at there is my claim isn't, oh, isn't simply, oh, well, if you contradict yourself, you know, there's the law of explosion and therefore you can't contradict yourself. My point is that if you allow any true contradictions, you have deflated the notion of truth with or without the principle of explosion. If there's any circumstance whatsoever where something is true is false, that means truth is not something that's universal. It's not absolute. It's not a, even a clear, coherent concept. And I don't quite understand the, the project of saying, oh, well, we're not going to trivialize because what's the big deal about trivialization? If it's the case that you allow contradictions into your theory, I don't see what the hesitation is about trivialization. Because if some things are true or false, why wouldn't everything be true or false? <laughs> and, and of course, I, again, put, put it this way, there is no coherent way to make sense of the claim that Proposition X is both true and not true at the same time. You can say something like that, but I don't think you can coherently make sense of it. Okay, so that's that. I got several really important questions but yeah. let's go on that <laughs> uh, just on that thread by what what are those other measures so if we say contradiction is no longer the standard what are the other ones okay well for logicians there's been uh, attempts at pr non-triviality proofs is something that also of course has occupied um, uh, 20th century logicians uh, from Hilbert uh, to Gerdel, for instance, like they wanted to make sure that they could prove that they had some kind of consistency, mm -hmm. right? Gerdel showed us, well, forget about it, right? We can only get relative consistency proof, as in, if you have a stronger theory that is consistent, then you can show that your smaller theory is also consistent, but then you're at the top, right? One of the other areas I didn't mention earlier, that comes up in the rationalist worldview all the time, is Gerdel. Gödel and his famous incompleteness theorems. Now, I haven't written anything about the incompleteness theorems yet because this is something I've been working on for 
some time now, and just like with the long piece I wrote on Cantor, had to do a lot of research. I had to get my ducks sorted out really precisely before I criticized the theory. But I would claim Gödel's incompleteness theorems, at best, are profoundly abused to prove things that Gödel didn't prove. Um, Gödel's incompleteness theorems, at worst, is a bunch of nonsense that no, almost nobody has actually works through the proofs because they're incredibly convoluted. And my analysis is definitely somewhere near the latter than the former. I think it's another case, just like Cantor's supposed proof of the different sizes of infinities, I think there are some fundamental conceptual errors that happen with Gödel's incompleteness theorems that people then compound and abuse to prove all kinds of ridiculous things that they actually can't prove. Now, unlike my claim about the non-existence of the infinity of infinities, if you're familiar with Cantor's diagonal arguments, I haven't written a piece to back that up yet, so feel free to flame me in the comment section. Oh my gosh, I think Gödel's incompleteness theorems are actually probably misguided, and I don't have anything to back it up yet. But don't worry, at some point, I guarantee I will have probably multiple pieces, both explaining the Gödel's incompleteness theorems, which I intend to do further in this series as I'm talking math to other mathematicians, and uh, you might say debunking some of the radical claims that people make by appealing to Gödel's incompleteness theorems. Why do I go on about all this is that it was, okay, so I, I guess like what Gödel showed is that Hilbert's idea of showing that mathematics was consistent is probably unachievable, hmm. right? So 20th century logicians are, are in no better position to tell us that their theory um, is, is non-trivial, if, if it's rich enough. Okay, again, if you haven't heard these ideas before, I don't think it will immediately strike you just how serious and grave and profound these claims are. That supposedly, according to Gödel and others, the project of mathematics, of building this kind of universally consistent and provable system, failed. It's over. This happened in the early part of the 20th century with Gödel's incompleteness theorems, supposedly. But if the theory of mathematics is powerful enough, meaning you have um, enough explanatory power in your, your system of language, for example, if you express terms like all mathematically, then you inescapably run into either inconsistencies or unprovable propositions. This is one of the areas in mathematics you guys know I criticize quite a lot, where there is a, a feverish level of dogmatism, not unlike um, Cantor's supposed diagonal proof, that if you so much as suggest that maybe it's not set in stone, <laughs> that Gödel proved that this project of founding mathematics with a consistent and universal and provable language, then you're immediately seen as a heretic who has not, of course, grasped the highest levels of abstraction that you'll find in mathematics. As you work your way up the level of mathematical abstraction and profundity, eventually at the top you discover your eyes cross and suddenly everything becomes contradictory and paradoxical. Or maybe Gödel was wrong. One of the interesting things that, that I challenge everybody listening to do is if they know anybody who has, stakes a position, if somebody mentions Gödel's incompleteness theorems, I practically guarantee that they'll hold the position um, that Dr. Girard holds, that they be believe that Gödel proved what he supposedly proved. And I can practically guarantee you, in fact, I believe everybody that I've spoke to ever on this subject, this applies to, and I actively seek these people out. Nobody works through the proofs themselves. It's all secondhand. It's all, I, wrote a, I, I read a book on the proofs, or I read a secondary thing. They actually don't dive into the actual Gödel incompleteness theorems themselves. It's all this secondhand stuff. I think that's a problem, especially because if you <laughs> look at the proofs, you might not quite find it as compelling as you think it should be, given the importance of what is being claimed. But anyway, this is not a breakdown about Gödel's incompleteness theorems yet. We continue. So let me ask you, um, <laughs> before we go back to contradiction, about mathematics. You said 20th century, the project of putting 20th century mathematics as being this perfectly consistent thing. You think that's, that project is, is toast? 
people are still trying to do that. Um, it's not entirely toast, but what counts as a proof of consistency had to be revisited. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what, I, I, again, you need to go talk to some proof theorists mm -hmm. and that probably, you know, travel to somewhere in America or Germany or somewhere, <laughs> where you'll find proof theorists talking about it. It's just that what uh, we take to be a, a consistency proof has to be adapted in ways that will not fall for Gödel's uh, okay. thing. So, so the, the mathematics that they use to prove consistency itself becomes exceedingly complex. All right, so now I ask him a question that I should have asked earlier about this notion of the inescapability of contradiction with the relative power of the logical theory that you're dealing with. Would you say that this is a fair analogy or, or a, fail, a, a fair analysis of the two areas in, in logic and in mathematics? That in the system of logic, in the classical logic, <clears throat> Our systems, even if they're complex and intricate and detailed and beautiful and powerful, are always going to contain in the system of logic itself an inescapable contradiction, at least one. Not all of them, no. Not all of them. Not all of them. There are some. It depends how complex it gets. Right? Okay. Okay. What about, what about just... Uh, so you take, for instance, I don't know, uh, propositional logic. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. You know, 20th century propositional logic, you know, we have consistency proof for that. We're okay. fine. Okay. Because it, and, and it's not expressive enough to be able to, it's not self-referential. Okay. Right, so you need to, you need to throw in it, you need to throw in more expressivity, so quantifiers, and then you start adding it enough rules so that it can start, like, doing some mathematics. You need to be able to do enough. So this is an area that a lot of people um, are unaware of, and this is where Gödel's incompleteness theorems often get abused. In math and logic, there are different orders of logic. Of course, I'm speaking in a jargonistic academic perspective. This is the standard way that mathematicians and philosophers and logicians think about things. It's not necessarily the truth, but there's, there is so-called zero-width order logic, or as it's sometimes called propositional logic, that is a system which doesn't allow for um, a great deal of expression. So it doesn't have what's called quantifiers. Then above zero-width order logic, or propositional logic, you have first-order logic, which does allow for things like quantifiers. Now, all that means is you can essentially say more things within your logical system. As you add variables and quantifiers into your system, you're able to say more, you're able to make more statements. Propositional logic is a internally consistent, complete system. That This is something that everybody, at least who understands the topic, um, agrees to. Gödel's incompleteness theorems don't apply to propositional logic. It's once you get into the higher levels of logic where you start having quantifiers, where you can say things like, there exists an X such that Y and Z and so on, then you supposedly run into Gödel's incompleteness theorems because you're able to generate within that system a sentence like, this statement is unprovable, which is similar to the liar's sentence. So that's where he's saying, you know, it's not that this notion that Gödel's incompleteness theorems or the, what you might say is the inescapable inconsistency or unprovability of a logical system is universal, you do have propositional logic, which is a more restricted system, or to use the earlier analogy, it's a really small lasso. Okay, so then the question would be, why would it be necessary to expand the logic outside of propositional logic, outside of this beautiful system that contains no, no contradictions? Why would we even Because you're missing out on validities. So if you okay. only have propositional logic, you can't even get good old syllogisms like uh, from antiquity, or, uh, uh, you know, all humans are mortal, Sophie is human, therefore Sophie is mortal. Okay. Right? So if, if you only have propositional logic, then you can't, you can't get at the validity, the validity of that. Okay. Right? Because all humans are mortal has a quantifier in there. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the quantifier, only, you can only translate it as P. 
Okay. So you get P, <laughs> and then you get Sophie as model. Well, you can't. You don't have names to talk about Sophie, right. so that's just Q. Right. And the conclusion, you know, is R. Okay. And you can't get R from P and Q, so that comes out as invalid. Okay. So. So we're missing out on validities. So that's why we need to throw in some quantifiers. Okay. So don't be overwhelmed by the jargon here. This is actually a really interesting point. And again, it comes up, it's throughout mathematics, but it's this desire to put our conceptual reasoning into the language of mathematics, which some people might think is synonymous with into a language of mathematical logic. And in fact, I would say there's a, there's a fundamental problem that plagues what seems to be every area of thought, and it's this desire to mathematize everything. But unfortunately, not all of our concepts can be neatly packed into mathematical structures and formulas. So the desire to do this, and I'm not exaggerating here, by the way, the desire to be able to break down our conceptual claims about the world into some kind of a mathematical structure has led to building these theories of propositional logic, first-order logic, higher-order logics. And in those systems, people conclude that inconsistency is inescapable and contradictions are inescapable and they literally will turn around and make claims about the world like the world is fundamentally paradoxical or we can't know anything about anything because in their attempt to formalize math mathematize everything they've discovered some you know some fundamental inconsistency in their language this is, again, something I talk about in Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge, that all of these claims about inconsistency are about language. They're not about the world. They're not about truth. They're not about logic. They're about language. You sort of see a similar phenomenon when people are talking about quantum physics, and they're trying to justify their irrational worldview by saying, no, no, there are true contradictions because superposition in quantum physics, which, of course, usually reveals they don't know what they're talking about in quantum physics. But again, if it's the case, like in quantum physics, that it appears that reality is blurry, you're presented with a question, do you have a clear perception of a blurry reality, or do you have a blurry perception of a clear reality? Is reality the way that it is, and you have got some smudge on your glasses, or are the glasses you're wearing perfectly clean, but you're looking at a smudged reality? If you understand the analogy, that's kind of what's going, what really does go on quite a lot in this world of mathematics and mathematical logic, is people think, you know, mathematics is the language of the universe, and then they find some kind of inconsistency or trouble with their mathematical language and conclude, therefore, the world is contradictory. And the only way that they can get away with this is because of the allure of math, that it seems really intelligent. It seems kind of mystical, the mathematical language. Imagine I were to say, guys, I have this concept of being a square, and I have this concept of being a circle. And you know what? I'm going to put them together. There is such a thing as a square circle. Look. Look at the sentence. There it is. There is such a thing as a square circle. Wow, it must be that reality is contradictory because I put those words together. <laughs> People would say, Steve, what are you smoking? That's, that's totally ridiculous. And yet it happens all the time with mathematics. People will make, I think, linguistic errors in math and draw profound epistemological claims from their linguistic confusions. If you don't believe me and if you're unaware of this area of thought, don't take my word for it. Just punch in Google or punch in YouTube, you know, uh, girdle and the limits of knowledge. I don't know. That just made up that, that title. But there's a billion different lectures of people talking about how magical these mathematical conclusions are. That, oh, man, we've developed our mathematic and logical system, and it tells us this amazing thing that if we want a, a logical system to be powerful enough, it's going to in inevitably result in creating inconsistencies. I don't buy it, folks. This is why I say a massive amount of revision has to be done in the world of modern mathematics. There's something very interesting in what you're saying there, though, because obviously for logicians anyway, and logicians that like to devise these languages, these languages that are only truthy, right? Mm -hmm. Back to the languages that we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier on. There's a, cho there's a choice as to the control you can have in terms of like controlling inconsistency and triviality and how much 
uh, expressivity it will give you into sort of trying to understand valid inferences and mm -hmm. truthy kind of things that you're kind of after, right? Mm -hmm. So if you s so as we said, like when we when we say a propositional propositional logic, we're cool. The problem is that we're missing out on valid arguments that we'd like to have, right? So we start putting th there's a trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so we add the quantifiers, and then we're still cool. So long as we only have the quantifiers, now we got this argument that we wanted. Right. But then we're missing out on some valid argument in mathematics. And now we start throwing in some widgets to get at some mathematics, and then Gödel shows up. So I think this is another kind of central idea in this, this balance between you know, the expressivity of the logical system and the internal c consistency of it. There's this idea that, that he brought up that, oh, well, in natural language, we can make sense, sort of, of the liar's paradox. We can say this sentence is false, and, oh, well, we know what that means. Therefore, our logical systems have to account for that. And that is most definitely not my claim. My claim is that actually the liar's sentence, this sentence is false, is a trick of language. It's an illusion. When you actually examine it really, really precisely, it falls apart, and you, what, the way that people think they make sense of it isn't actually correct. They don't make sense of something that they think they're making sense of. So yeah, if you, have, if you try to codify a linguistic error, then you're going to have errors in that codified system. If in your mathematical system you, can, you think that you can say this sentence is false, references this sentence is false without a problem, well... That's a fundamental bug in the system. And again, we have these two options. Is it that the bug is in the system and that's just the way it is because all logical systems, if they're powerful enough, are going to run into this error? Or is it the case that, yeah, it's a bug in the system because we've made a mistake, you know, because we've programmed it wrong? But doesn't it seem like that would be a statement about some kind of flaw about expressivity? That it's like the more you... If you want to say more and more and more, eventually you, say, you can say so much that it includes contradictions. Is, uh, is that a flaw or is that just what it's all about? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if anything, English, the kind of language, language that you and I are using at the moment, has, has all these things that we can express, the, the, the liar sentence, and we can express all these kind of things, right? Once we start developing language and using them for reasoning and for trying to get at truth and validity mm -hmm. and things like that, well, the tools that we're using can hurt us too, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, so... So, 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 so it's, it's, it's always trying to find the right balance between how you're going to express how you're getting at truth and the tools that you're using and how much control you have on the tools that you're using. Okay, so then we have a, a bit of a discussion about the specifics of the liar's paradox. I'll tell you a little bit more detail about this later. When the, this sentence is false, when we say hey, this is a true contradiction and it's true and false at the same time, this is something, would you say that that's a, a violation of the law of identity? the old Aristotelian A is A, and maybe the law of non-contradiction, right, obviously. I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't think so. So would you think that the law of non-contradiction can be violated and pre you could still preserve the law of identity? Yes. Okay, can yes. you explain that? Because so for, for intuitively, when we say something like, when we, has, uh, we use the term not A versus A, it seems like, the whole meaning of what not is is a negation of A. It's like yes. That's the whole reason we come up with the concept. Is like not means a big X over it. Like yes. absolutely not, which seems in, in, incompatible with A, the whole point of A, right? Okay, so this, again, is the center part of square one, the foundations of knowledge. That's what practically the whole book about is explaining this, that it must be in order to have the law of identity that things are what they are. It must be the case that you have the law of non-contradiction, that things cannot be the way that they are not. Because if things can be the way that they are not, then things being things, being what they are, is not some kind of universal law. If you can be what you aren't, then I'd say there's no being in the first place. I think, I think the intuition you're getting at is that true, what is true and what is false are mutually exclusive, Yeah. right? 
Sure. Right. And the liar just like goes has a, has a foot in both. So there you go. I mean, sometimes it kills me. I, I, got, I get flack from people sometimes. And they say, oh, Steve, nobody actually argues for logical contradictions. Nobody actually argues that true and false aren't mutually exclusive. No, you just heard it. In fact, I think there's a great number of these people that think true, what is true and what is false is not mutually exclusive because the liar's paradox, or sometimes because quantum physics. This is a huge deal, folks. If you care about the world of ideas and you wonder why it appears that the modern world is steeped in a bit of irrationalism, I'm suggesting this is one reason why. It is the liar's paradox and the abuse of the liar's paradox, where People are thinking that what sometimes what is true is false, and eh, that's okay. Now, of all the people on Earth, I am probably the person who is more <laughs> revolted in, in the exact polar opposite of this position than anybody, which is interesting because Dr. Gerard and I got along so well. I mean, he was super pleasant. He invited me up to this beautiful property. I like the guy a lot, but we are on absolute opposite ends of the spectrum. What I've also noticed, and I, I've also felt, pray to this before, is that people who have strong opinions about the internal co coherence of mathematics tend not to be mathematicians. That mathematics gets defended for being this consistent and coherent and rational discipline from people who aren't, who aren't mathematicians. Because if you, if you go through the training, you learn about girls and completeness theorems, you learn about the infinity of infinities. I think it immediately breeds out of you this uh, pre-20th century notion that mathematics is kind of the perfect logical discipline. In the modern world, it isn't. If anybody would like a book recommendation to, that goes into a bit more detail about this um, state of modern mathematics, there's a book by Morris Klein called Mathematics, The Loss of Certainty. I highly recommend it, even though some of it is fairly technical. It goes through some of the history of why there is indeed a loss of certainty in modern mathematics. And his position is, is not my position. His position is, well, that's, you know, it's not a damning of the profession of modern mathematics. That's just the state. That's just the truth of the matter. My position is, oh, well, that damns the mathematics profession. Okay. Right. So is the, so I guess <laughs> the question that I have for you is how are we to make sense of true, what that means, if we're saying... In at least one circumstance, what can be, what is true is false. Because in the way that I'm conceiving of truth and falsehood, I would say, by definition, is mutually exclusive. That's the, the right, meaning of the Right, but that, that was the dream of the lasso. Right. Yeah. And that dream won't, and if you want to have the lasso, then that lasso is an inconsistent thing. Or the lasso does not exist. <laughs> right? That, but that, that, but that, that, is, that is the dilemma, right? But how do you make sense of it? So how do you make sense of the concept of true when it encompasses not true? In some cases. It's just that cases, truth yeah. and falsity are not mutually exclusive. That's how I'm, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the sentence, but how do you make, so I'm saying, okay, I'm there. I'm like, I'm at the doorstep. Yep, okay, what does that mean? How can I make sense of that? I, I understand the perspective, we have to accept it. But I say, okay, let's accept it. Let's act at least like we accept it. But how do I make sense of it now? Or can it be made sense of? I don't want to answer the question directly. So, do you know, do you know about David Lewis and his um, idea of modal realism? Mm -mm. So he's committed to the existence of other possible worlds. Okay. So he does modal logic and he talks about counterfactuals, and he basically in his in his picture of in his in his metaphysical picture there are infinitely many possible worlds and all these worlds are sort of causally independent entities and they fold stories of everything. So okay. we are in the possible worlds and there are other possible worlds, the way this world could have been. So, mm -hmm. you know, there could be three people in this room, there could be four people in this room, there could be nobody in this room, and, you know. So mm -hmm. each of those is a different... Okay. Is, so it's like right. a multiverse theory. So it's, of. Uh, sort of. It's, yeah. it's the same kind of story. Anyway, the point is that he's defended the view that uh, that these worlds exist just as much as others. And mm -hmm. people have said exactly what I you're saying. I have heard this argument, but I didn't know the name. <laughs> yeah, okay, so it's called modal realism. Um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm not getting into this to rehearse the argument. Sure. I think the point is that 
people to him had the same kind of reaction, just this kind of incredulous look. <laughs> what do you mean? I can't make sense of other possible worlds existing like ours. Okay. To which he would say, sure, me neither. That <laughs> doesn't mean it's not the best explanation of what I'm after. This is a really interesting example. And when, I, when he gave it, as you'll hear in a second, I wanted to give it the benefit of the doubt and say, oh, I can make sense of that. I don't know why he's saying it. He can't. The person who proposed it is saying both, I can't make sense of this and it's the best theory, which is hard for me to understand. So I naively gave him the benefit of the doubt and said this. Well, I can make sense of that to say, I mean, I, we would incorporate something like the, the multiverse theory that I don't think this is necessarily the case, but I can, I can at least okay, imagine so, a okay. consistent way to say there is this universe, there is another universe, these two universes are not the same. What we mean by a possible universe is simply a kind of a descriptor of that other universe. Yeah, no, so, but, uh, so I think that's not exactly the right kind of analogy because okay. a multi if, if we live in a multiverse, then that's one possible world because we could live in a different multiverse. So it kind of depends on where you carve the boundaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so he's saying so it's, it's outside the boundaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay, now that I can't make sense of this. <laughs> see, what, see what I mean? Okay. So, you, so, so but that's, the, that's the same kind of thing. With, at some point, once you start exploring these kind of ideas, mm -hmm. yeah, it's incredulous. And I sort of, yeah, I'm, I'm still a bit there with you as when I contemplate the liar sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's hard to make sense of it. A aside from just like repeating it. Yeah, it's true. Ah, so it's false. Yeah, so it's false. Yeah, and it's true. And then you just keep on going. And eventually you just stop worrying too much about the fact that this sentence is incredulous because you have other motivation okay. around it for dealing with these kinds of systems. Okay. Right? So the, the idea is, I mean... So could, would you say something like this then, that <laughs> it is not the case that truth is absolute in the sense that we have to accept in our conception of what truth means that you bump up into the incredulous sentences and that's just the nature of the game. Yeah, if, if, you, yeah, if you dig far enough with any kinds of concept, if you dig far enough, you might reach boundaries in which you see incredulous things. And <laughs> when these things are, th you know, and, and what to do with them. Right. Of course, that's when it becomes all fascinating, right? It's, it's, it's not that they were wrong in the 20th century to say, oh my God, go away. There's no <laughs> truth predicate. That, that, that's perfectly fine. And in, 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 like, like against modal realists, some people will say, well, there are no possible words. That makes no sense. Go away. Kind of thing. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with the incredulous things when you meet them? That's when all the fun begins, isn't it? And with all due respect, this, from my perspective, is a self-refutation, both of this modal realist position and of Dr. Girard's position, the Paris consistent logician's position, to say, okay, I admit we can't make sense of it, but that's the profundity of the theory is in my worldview to cross one's eyes, open one's mouth and drool. You, you can't, the purpose of philosophizing is to best explain the phenomena that we experience. We must be able to make sense of the theories that we posit. And if it's the case that our theory is so presented as to be incomprehensible even to us, that theory has refuted itself. And how does a theory go about doing this? Well, it contradicts itself because you can't make sense of a logical contradiction. So I tried to say with the modal realism example, like, oh, well, I can make sense of that. It's like the multiverse. You say, no, 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 well, it's a possible universe. So the multiverse doesn't, would be our one universe, and there's these other universes that exist, but they're outside the realm of existence. They're possible universes, but they're actual. And then people said, what the hell does that mean? And his response was, well, I can't make sense of it, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. This is the mystical perspective. This is the idea that, yes, there are an infinity of infinities, and I can't really make sense of it, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Or quantum physics shows that the world is true and false at the same time, or it is and it isn't, and it is both, and I can't make sense of it, but wow, that's the profound nature of the universe. And we see it here. The liar's paradox is true and false at the same time, and he says himself that, no, I can't make sense of it. It is incredulous, and the proper response is to just repeat it and say, yeah, okay, it's true, and yeah, okay, it's false, and you, you know, move on because you have other motivation. If anybody is wondering why I spend so much time talking about mathematics and logic, this is an excellent example. If you cut at the foundations of all philosophic reasoning, 
by admitting logical contradictions into your theory, you have thrown out rationality in its entirety. If you have created a theory that is incomprehensible, admittedly, and you still believe that theory, it is as if you are a doctor that has used a scalpel to cut off your patient's head. It is the greatest violation of you know, the, the project of rationality and intellectualism. You can't contradict yourself, folks, because you can't make sense of it, and it is not respectable or correct to believe an incomprehensible theory. And that being said, I don't want to imply that, you know, Dr. Girard or Graham Priest or Justin Clark Doan from Columbia, when I interviewed him, are all stupid, as if, like, their brains aren't working correctly. From interacting with them, I don't think they are stupid. I think they are fundamentally, profoundly, profoundly, deeply misguided. You know, as if, it, it, like, a, a runner, you know, a very talented and muscular runner whose legs are on backwards. And when the, you know, the, the track gun fires, not only does he not move forward, he moves backwards. Yeah, I, it's how I view these people, that I, I have no doubt that there is, you know, mental processing power there. They're nice people, but they're so far away from the truth as to be running in the opposite direction and, and then amputating their own legs when they embrace the idea that it's okay to be inconsistent and incomprehensible when developing a theory. But that's where I'm going to have to li leave it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview breakdown. We did talk for a, about another solid hour that wasn't recorded about the liar's paradox, which is why if you guys were listening closely to this interview, there's kind of an abrupt transition where it goes from, you know, we talk about the liar's paradox. He says, hey, you know, um, I think you should talk to somebody who's like an expert on this topic. And um, that's because there's a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> in the middle that wasn't recorded. It was, a, it was a magnificent conversation, honestly. One of the highlights of our entire New Zealand trip was, was talking to Patrick Gerard about this. I loved it. Um, but let's just say the, my proposed resolution to the liar's paradox was not um, satisfactorily refuted. And so he had a good suggestion, which I will take him up on, which is um, finding somebody that specializes in the liar's paradox and can address my resolution to the liar's paradox and tell me why it actually is this inescapable true contradiction. So if you enjoyed this interview breakdown, you are a gigantic nerd, and that's great. So am I. There's a lot of us. Our movement is growing. You may also have a rational head on your shoulders. If you think that maybe my analysis is onto something, maybe it's the case that... Professional mathematicians and logicians might have made the largest of intellectual errors ever that had been repeated maybe for the last century, then you're not alone. Our community is growing by the week. And if you'd like to support this project of me going around talking to these people and trying to create a rational worldview myself by writing books and doing YouTube videos, check out patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. You can become a patron of the show. You can become a patron of my work. So whenever I release an article or a video or one of these podcasts, you contribute a dollar or two to help make this show possible. If it's the case that my suspicions are correct about the causes of irrationalism in the past century, we have a gigantic amount of work in front of us. I'm excited to do it. I know many of you are too. So I hope you'll join me in the mutual pursuit of truth and the attempt to create a rational worldview. And make sure to join me next week where I'm talking with a professor about a very similar topic that I pretty much went to Australia to talk to this guy. I'm not going to give any more details away. Just make sure to tune in next week. Have a good one. <laughs>